Hey, everybody. My name is Amanda Tosoff. And I'm Jody Prosnick. And uh, we are two thirds of uh, Music Education Hub Music Arts Collective. The other one third is Francesca Fung, who is uh, managing the chat. So t say hello to her in the chat and definitely let us know uh, where you're tuning in from, because we'd love to we'd love to hear uh, where you're where you are. Um, we're so, so excited about today. This is actually number 10 of our uh, live streams that we've been doing since September. And we've had some fantastic special guests, Celine Peterson, Heather Bambrick, Emily Claire Barlow, Lala Bialy, Sharantha Bedegay, a whole bunch of others. And um, you can definitely go check those out on our YouTube or our website, as well as some, some other workshops that we've been doing, including one that's coming up that's uh, appropriately themed for this week, International Women's Day. Um, it's a Sisters in Jazz Day uh, that is for all ages and levels. And um, we hope that you'll go check that out uh, from our site. And um, yeah, and uh, we'll be doing some improv and composition workshops as well as some listening to some legends of jazz, some legendary women of jazz. So you can go check that out. Speaking of amazing, amazing jazz legends, um, we are so excited to have the amazing Rini Rosnes on our live stream to celebrate International Women's Day, which is tomorrow. And let me tell you a little bit about Rini because most of you, I'm sure, already know who she is. But when you actually talk about all that she has done in her career, it's pretty amazing, <laughs> impressive, and um, incredible. So Rini is really one of the premier jazz pianists and composers of her generation. When she moved to New York City from Vancouver, she quickly established a reputation of high regard. She toured and recorded with such jazz masters as Joe Henderson, Wayne Shorter, Bobby Hutcherson, J.J. Johnson, James Moody, and she's still performing with the legendary bassist, one of my personal favorites, Ron Carter. She's a charter member of the all-star ensemble, the San Francisco Jazz Collective, um, she toured with them for six years, and she has released and recorded 17 acclaimed recordings. Her 2016 recording, Written in the Rocks, was named one of the best jazz albums of the year by the Chicago Tribune and was awarded a 2017 Juno um, for Best Jazz Album of the Year. That was actually her fifth Juno Award. Um, she is a virtuoso composer, virtuoso pianist, and one of the things we love so much about her is not only is she a brilliant band leader and composer and in her own right, but she also is an amazing accompanist. Um, and she's married to um, jazz pianist Bill Sharlap, and they often perform in a two piano setting. She's also featured on four tracks from the 2019, wrong decade, wrong, wrong century, <laughs> 2015 Grammy Award winning Tony Bennett and Bill Sharlap. So she's on a Grammy winning album as well. But her latest project is as music director for Artemis. It's an international all-star band featuring vocalist, vocalist Celine McLaurin Salvant, clarinetist Danette Cohen, trumpeter Ingrid Jensen, another BC jazz uh, friend, tenor saxophonist Melissa Aldana, bassist Noriko Ueda, and drummer Allison Miller. Um, and we're going to chat a little bit about Artemis, given that it's International Women's Day, and they happen to be not only some of the top musicians in the world, but they all happen to be all women, which is kind of outstanding and amazing. So um, I, we have lots of stories. And one of the things uh, before we invite Rini on is just to let you know that Amanda and I have a close uh, personal connection with Rini because she's from the West Coast of Canada, which is where we grew up as well. So she was the lighthouse, the beacon for uh, both of us as we were starting to figure out our own musical past. Um, so to say that she is a hero to us would be an understatement. And to say that we are excited would be an understatement. So let's please welcome Rini Rosnitz to the stage. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Welcome, Brini. Hi. Hi, Hi, thanks for being yourself. here. You're welcome. <laughs> Wonderful to see your faces with no masks. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Amazing. Well, um, we're really, really excited to talk about um, some, some really fun topics and also hope that people in the chat will um, ask some questions that you're willing to answer because uh, I know there's going to be many. So super, super excited um, to get into it. So Jody, do you want to start it off? Yes. Um, so 
Um, we well, the first thing we just want to always ask our our um, guests is, what is your musical background? What's the story? What got you on piano? What got you on this path that you're on today? So your earliest formative um, stories, and what started you on jazz? Being a, a young woman growing up in the North Shore of Vancouver. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll make it brief. Um, I began piano lessons at age three. And the reason I started so young was that I had two older sisters who were already taking lessons and mom said I was trying to imitate them. So that's why I started with the lessons so young. Um, so I don't really remember a time when I didn't play, at least uh, play the piano. Uh, at age five, I also uh, began uh, violin lessons and I continued both of those instruments uh, with with lessons on both instruments through uh, until I went to university. Um, then I quit the violin ostensibly, even though I still own one and I do mess around with it sometimes. Um, in high school, I was blessed to have a very uh, passionate and enthusiastic uh, and knowledgeable band director, whom I imagine both of you know is um, Bob Repliati mm -hmm. uh, over in North Vancouver at Hansworth. And uh, he introduced me to, to jazz. He recruited me for the, what was then called the stage band. <laughs> I don't know if they still call it that. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And my, you know, whole new world, musical world opened up for me. And I, I fell in love with, with the sound of the music. And, and specifically, I was intrigued with the art of improvisation. Mm -hmm. So uh, in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's my time in, in, in Vancouver, musically. Amazing. I was just going to say that I remember Hansworth. Um, I know Lila Bialy and, and Brandy Disterheft both went there, and I remember them being the rival school. Darcy, of Darcy James argued oh, too yeah. to Hansworth. Yeah, yeah. there's. Oh, I remember them being the rivals of our schools. Uh, we were at Semi Amu. Semi -Amu. Anyway, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good music program. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Well, um, I guess the next question that I'm I'm curious about is just your how you got yourself to New York. Um, I know that. Uh, Myself thinking about going there, it sounds it would be it sounds terrifying getting up on the stage with all these amazing musicians. And I'm just I'm just wondering, like, how did you find the confidence as a young woman heading to New York to get up on stage with people like Joe Henderson and all these wonderful uh, legends of jazz? And I'm just wondering, you know, and, and not only um, not only have courage, but you, you thrived in that environment. And I'm just wondering, like, what? How did how did you build that 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 courage and confidence and what does it take to get up on stage and, and do that? We're just wondering if you could speak to a little bit of that. Uh, sure. Yeah, that's a rather broad question. <laughs> yes. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take it in steps. I mean, initially I went to New York uh, armed with a Canada Council of the Arts grant. And my intention was to to go and, and live there for a, a, a year and study and you know immerse myself in the music and in the city and and meet players and jam and just you know study as hard as i could and within that first year uh i realized soon after i arrived that i really wouldn't want to go back to vancouver right away because i felt like i was growing a lot and playing and meeting so many great young musicians people who who were of like mind and enjoyed the same kind of music, you know, mm -hmm. and I had opportunities to, to play with a lot of people. Um, and then towards the end of the first year, uh, I had a phone call from Joe Henderson, who uh, was, asked me if I would be interested in, in joining him on a, a European tour. And I'd never met Joe before. Uh, I believe that I was recommended to him through uh, the great drummer, Terry Lynn Carrington, whom he'd also asked to go uh, with him on this same tour, but she was busy um, with numerous projects, I'm sure, even at that time. Um, so, you know, I was floored and thrilled and, and of course, accepted the invitation. And I, I just 
I don't know that, and moving on to the second part of your question about having courage or, you know, I, I never thought of it that way. I just mm -hmm. knew that I had to become the best player I could. I actually didn't even have any thoughts of, at that time about how unusual it might be for a woman jazz musician. Of course, mm -hmm. pianists are m more, uh, you know, there's more of them than say, drummers or you know trombonists trumpet players etc um but for me it was all about just preparation and i mm -hmm. i sure i had butterflies and and uh you know was uh, uh i don't know what the word is not not worried but challenged with trying to do my best uh but the only way i felt to deal with those feelings was just to be as prepared as I could be. And mm. uh, that's kind of something that holds true I, today too. Um, that's really the key to, to gaining courage is just to be as prepared as you can. And of course that never ends, right? You know, as musicians and what we're, what we do, especially in, in this music, you know, it's never ending. We, we're, we're always searching for uh, deeper ways to play and, um, just you know the tradition of this music is so huge and there's just so much to learn and to study that it it uh it's a lifetime pursuit amazing preparation 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 um wow so man that was that's amazing i i like that you acknowledged though the and called them butterflies rather than like anxiety or or you know terror it was like oh yeah it's almost just like yearning to do your very best or something like and just this like excitement to to do your best it's like switching sure. the negativity like, yeah um i love it i mean i remember playing uh after the european tour with joe which was incredible and just to to tour europe uh it wasn't the first time i'd been there uh but not it was the first time as a musician as a professional musician touring and uh just traveling all over the world with this amazing saxophonist uh and playing night after night and hearing his level mm -hmm. of consistency it was just so inspiring you know he'd get mm -hmm. through a solo on any given piece and i would just be thinking oh God, I have to play after that, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was just fun. It was just mm -hmm. a lot of fun. And uh, I remember when we came back to New York and we played at the Vanguard, and that was my first, uh, the Village Vanguard Club in, in New York City. Um, it was my first time playing there. And it seemed like uh, every hero that was in the city at the time of mine, every pianist that I admired came down. Tommy Flanagan, Peter Walton, oh uh, Michelle Petrucciani, you know, Ronnie Matthews, uh, George Cables, uh, uh, Richard Byrack came down that week. I mean, just all these, and, and it was overload for me. You know, I yeah. just, I, I had to just play and I couldn't concentrate on the fact that all those people were in the audience from night to night, you know? And I, I have neglected to mention that that was uh, the, the rhythm section I toured with Joe was an all woman rhythm section, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which was Sylvia Cuenca on drums and a bassist named Kim Clark. And Kim actually was <laughs> seven months pregnant on the road. So that was quite an experience for her and for us. And she had, uh, taken leave of the band for obvious reasons. And um, in came uh, Marlene Rosenberg from a mm, great mm, Chicago. She's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was it was Marlene and, and Sylvia and I uh, at the Vanguard. And uh, so that was just, a, you know, it was an eye opener. It was kind of, you know, what did they say? Uh, uh, baptism by fire. <laughs> Yeah, I think that there's, 
I think that there's a slight, I don't know about you, Amanda, but that, that idea of like actually being in New York, playing with someone and having your, the entire like jazz history show up at the club or something. It's almost like <laughs> nightmarish in a way. I think you just, you, you know, that's when the preparation must kick in. Like I'm prepared. I'm just going to do my thing to not just anchoring in my skill will help get rid of all that. Ah, look at all those people yeah. in the room. Well, the music is what's on your mind, mm -hmm. and the yeah, music yeah, is inspirational. Yeah. And the yeah. moment you start to yeah. think too deeply about or analyze what you're doing, that's yeah. when you run into trouble. I feel mm -hmm. that whenever there's issues in the bandstand, of especially any kind of nervousness, I mean, mm -hmm. the best thing you can do is just stop focusing on yourself and yeah. listening to what everyone else yeah. is playing, and mm -hmm. that'll do right away, or at least mm -hmm. should. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, you know, that was that was that experience. And then and then I had a similar experience on the telephone with with Wayne Shorter. I had never met Wayne and he called and it was actually kind of humorous because I was at a friend's place across the street uh, in Brooklyn. This is when I was living in Brooklyn. And um, I was just hanging out there and she received a phone call from my roommate who said, I've just given Wayne Shorter your phone number and he's gonna be calling there for Rini in a minute and I just wanted to let you know. And I was like, huh, what, <laughs> really? <laughs> and, um, and so I did, I, I, he called and I spoke with him and, and that was uh, thrilling. And of course I was uh, equally with Joe, I was just a huge fan and, uh, couldn't believe I was talking with him on the phone. And and uh, there was one funny story. I Forgive the audience whoever's heard this story before because I, I have shared it numerous times, but it's, it's, it's uh, humorous a bit, I think. Um, he asked me if I'd seen the movie Alien mm. on that phone, on that first phone call. And uh, I actually hadn't, so I let him know. And he said, well, it's, it's a... In so many words, he said, it's a prerequisite for joining the band. And he said, well, don't worry about it, uh, because uh, when you come to San Francisco to rehearse, um, we'll watch it together. So cut to the chase. We got to San Francisco, and we did watch the movie together one evening. And at the moment, there's a scene where the alien, um, I think it's called the chest burster scene, where the mm -hmm. alien out of I bet, uh, William Hurt's character's chest. And um, so Wayne takes the remote control and he, he stops it at that moment. And he said, see that? That's how I want my band to sound. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> what, did you, what did you think? Were you like, yeah, yeah I can do that? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't exactly sure what to think, but that's also because I didn't know Wayne that well at that moment, and it became very clear not long after that. I, he's talking about the element of surprise, you know, just, um, I don't know whether it was necessarily he meant the, the shock value, but just uh, the, the art of drama and the use of drama. Uh, within music, and of course, his music is full of drama, mm -hmm. and his playing, his own playing, is full of drama. Mm -hmm. So you know that was just I had to. With Wayne, he speaks in in metaphor very often, so you have to kind of just um, read between the lines. And usually, there's something very profound there, mm -hmm. so it's worth it. It's worth the thought. <laughs> I love that story so much. That is amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Imagine if that's what you, music school was like. You just watch, <laughs> play like it this. Should be more like that. <laughs> yeah, watch this. Okay, make a song like this. <laughs> well, which gets us actually into composition and creativity. Actually, this is a really good segue because um, actually off camera, man and I were just chatting about um, one of the things we love about your writing um, is the the way you connect other art forms to your art. Um, and so you draw inspiration from, you know, you like live artfully, you and art, you know, your whole life is art and you're drawing inspiration from all of these different things, including, um, 
nature, um, you know, your lived experience, your personal narrative, um, you know, collaborating with different artists in different ways. So um, this is a more of a general creativity question. I'm always really curious about pro creative process and like what inspires you to compose, you know, what are your conditions for, for creating? Um, when do you start to work on a project? How long does it take? I know these are a lot of questions and big questions, <laughs> but maybe you could just speak of like, perhaps, you know, when you write a piece or you decide, uh, like where did the concept for um, maybe written on the rocks come from? Like, was there something that happened that was like, oh, that's really interesting or a chain of events? Because I know it was based on science basically, right? Dar Darwinism mm -hmm. and, and yeah. evolution. So, so just maybe you could talk us a little bit through like, how do you get that germ of an idea? And then you sort of run with it to make a thing like from an yeah. germ of an idea to the manifestation, like what, yeah. What does that look like? Uh, I you know it, it, there's no real one way. It mm -hmm. comes, uh, my inspirations, as you mentioned, come from a lot of different uh, aspects of life and nature. And being Canadian, I think uh, I'm also very much drawn to uh, the metaphors in nature and just, uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's a, a Canadian sound per se, uh, but if there is, it's probably somewhat in the silences. Mm -hmm. um, it's just an open feeling um, to a lot of uh, original uh, compositions by Canadians. And I'm thinking of somebody like Kenny Wheeler. I mean, when mm -hmm. I hear his music, I just, I can hear nature in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether he felt that way exactly, even though I actually did interview him uh, at length. Uh, I don't remember him talking about nature, uh, but uh, I think that's kind of a through thread for for a lot of Canadians. Not that other people don't draw inspiration from nature as well, um, but it, it it happens. It 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 depends. You know, I mean, I can I take many different ways um, to find um, find melodies, find hooks, find bass lines, find rhythms. And usually it's, I, I can be inspired not just from something visual, but also if I'm listening to even a piece of classical music or something, I will hear something that, you know, mm. turns my ear and think, well, how can I use that? You know, how can I take that particular harmonic moment and grow something from it? Also, you know, it could just be a plain voicing. Um, on the Written on the Rocks album, there's a piece called Lucy from Afar. And uh, the very first chord is just a, a voicing I heard Chick Corea play. Uh, of course, he was a, a, a master, rest in peace. We're going to miss him so much. I know. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, just, just one chord. And then I... I was just messing around with that. I just loved the chord. And I thought, let me try and grow something from this. You know, usually it's all quite organic. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I've been writing a, an, a new album, which I've actually completed all the writing for, and I'll be recording it actually at the end of this month. Um, and I've had, you know, that's one thing about the pandemic is <laughs> as, as much of a drag as it is, I've had more time than I ever have to write. So that's kind of a blessing, you know, mm -hmm. it's just luxurious that way. Um, anyway, um, so one of the pieces on it is uh, basically dedicated to one of my favorite young, younger, well, well, it's not young anymore, a few years older than me, but I, I, I'm comparing him with like Duke Ellington. <laughs> <laughs> So middle-aged, I guess I have to say now. But anyway, Donald Brown. I don't know whether you're mm. hip to Donald Brown, but mm -hmm. one of my favorite albums is a, uh, an album he recorded called uh, Cause and Effect. And, the, and if you're not familiar with it, you should check it out because mm -hmm. I, oh, I just love his writing. Anyway, so I, I wanted to write a piece kind of in, not, not necessarily in tribute to him, but inspired by him. So, I, you know, I, there were just certain little things that Donald uses and I thought how can I make that my own how can I mm -hmm. take this little rhythmic idea and put it into this but not you know I don't want to be 
uh, what's the word, um, plagiarizing anything. Right, I, right. I want to use it as a, as a seed, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's lots, lots of ways to go about it. And uh, I, I probably tried to explore them all. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Well, well what, it's, it's whatever, a whatever it is, you know, can it, it can even be such a thing for me as, oh, I've never composed a piece in B minor before. Mm -hmm. Let me try that, you know, just something simple like that. It's that is so amazing. Um, I One of the things that stands out for me about that is this idea of like, again, just living in this experience sort of expanded space where you're constantly, oh, getting inspired, not throwing it out or just grabbing it, putting it in a basket and seeing what you can do with it. And that's, it seems like that's part of why you're so prolific and you you, you just, it's like this state of wonder you're in all the time. Like everything's exciting <laughs> or interesting. And you're like, wow, that story about, you know, evolution's interesting or, oh, I'm seeing an Emily Carr painting and it's inspiring me. I mean, I'm going to use that as this inspiration. And I think that's one of the things about your writing that's so, I don't know, I think probably Amanda and I both uh, say it's been so um, inspiring for us is because really in a way we all are living in a life and we can we can do that in our own world you know be mm -hmm. listening to an album and be like oh you know we all have stories like that of like a weird you know moment where you're like that turned into a whole thing because you just happen to sure. notice the moment right. you know notice the beauty notice the 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 chord notice the the story notice the painting notice the relationship yeah. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Mind, there's a mindset of just being open to it and being mm -hmm. being able to receive inspiration mm. that might be right there in front of you. You know, mm. um, another piece on the new album, uh, and I've, I haven't heard any of these pieces with any musicians yet, so I'm really looking forward to hearing if how it, how it lines up with what I've been imagining for the last year. <laughs> But um, last uh, spring in my yard here, there was a bird that was singing. And it had this little melody. It was, I can't sing myself, but it was, it was da 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 And it was up an octave, but that was it. And, uh, and it kept kind of haunting me and I'd go out in the morning and I'd hear it. I, just, I couldn't see it and I still don't know what it is. So I'm really looking forward to this spring because I've now got an app on my phone. It's a bird birding thing. And it's supposed to identify the, the bird, you know. So I'm, I'm still kind of searching for a title for the song because it would be nice to reference that particular bird because I've taken this little you know, motif and and turned it into a a piece. You need to um, give the birds some writing credits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I'm sure you know Maria Schneider, mm -hmm. uh, the great uh, composer and arranger. Well, she's a birder. She's a natural. You know, she goes out and and uh, goes bird birding, and mm -hmm. so I. I sent it to her and I said, I wrote it out on the clef and sent her a little clip. I said, do you know what this is? And well, she said it, it the nearest thing could be a black cat chickadee, but it doesn't do that part at the beginning. <laughs> so, anyway, oh my I'm gosh, still... that does not surprise me about Maria Schneider at all. You can, yeah. again, you can hear that in her, in her music. Right, mm -hmm. That's melodies cool. of the world, the nature, just you know, oozing right. through her music, which is why it resonates with us. I think, yeah. you know, yeah. And you, you mentioned Emily Carr, which uh, obviously is a she's a great Canadian painter whose work I've loved for many years, and I didn't really realize until I moved away from Canada how much the West Coast art and Indigenous art also plays a role, um, mm -hmm. or how much I missed seeing it. So um, the, the piece uh, on uh, my last album, it's called, well, the title track, Beloved of the Sky, um, Scorned as Timber, Beloved of the Sky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Emily's, or Emily, not on first name basis with her, but <laughs> Emily Carr's work, you know, it's deeply connected to nature. Mm -hmm. and, and 
there's just something about it that evokes a real emotional response in me. And um, that particular piece, uh, I could say, musically kind of related to the subtle degrees of light and uh, uh, the complexities of the, the the harmony and the simplicities of, or complexities, I should say, of the of the harmony and the rhythm. They they're reflected somehow in 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 that particular piece um, with the, with the tree reaching to the sky and mm -hmm. sort of part with this chord that goes up and it's kind of dissonant and you know which was the dissonance referred to. Uh, Emily Carr's displeasure at the logging, you know. So the just little subtle things that uh, it's actually kind of fun just to, you know, see how you can make tone poems or how you can relate the the, the image in into music, even though it's certainly not, um, you know, it's not a hard fact. Fact. It's it's really just how anyone anyone else can. Can look at a painting and draw something from it of, of their own, and that's that's the way the music should be heard too. Mm. Yeah. So one way to listen to it or to feel, you know, everybody mm -hmm. hears different, different things. I, sorry, Amanda, did you want? To I was just gonna say I love all this that you're talking about. Yeah. I'm 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 getting so many ideas. I feel like I should practice after this. <laughs> <We're composing. laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. Well, speaking of another um, another project, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about Artemis. Um, I've been enjoying this album so, so much. I know you released it, uh, I think in September, correct? Yeah, I think in that's early right. September. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about this project and, and where it, how it started, where it came about. Uh, well, it in initiated back in uh, 2016, uh, a promoter in France, uh, gave me a call and asked if I would like to put together an all-woman band to celebrate International Women's Day uh, <laughs> in Paris and uh, also in Luxembourg. And I don't, I hadn't really taken part too much in, in you know, assembling all-women bands just because it just seemed, why would you do that? You know, you just play with whoever you want to play with regardless of gender. Um, but there were lots of musicians that I would like to play with uh, who happened to be female. So um, that first band uh, encompassed Terry Lynn Carrington on drums, Linda Mayhan O on bass, uh, and then the rest of the band was what Artemis is now, which is Cecile uh, McLaurin Salvant, vocalist, clarinetist Anat Cohen, Melissa Aldana on tenor saxophone, and Ingrid Jensen on trumpet and uh, Noriko Ueda bass and Allison Miller on drums. I think you already said all that, so I'm being a bit. <laughs> it's okay, we can always hear them more, all of those names. Let's speak them loudly. <laughs> so we just had so much fun on those first concerts playing that we talked about trying to do more together. Uh, so in 2017, we uh, put together a tour. The band still wasn't called Artemis. It was called, uh, that particular tour was labeled uh, Woman to Woman. And uh, we did a 14-city tour. Um, and again, it was just a lot of fun. We had fun on stage. We had fun off stage. And we said, you know, let's, let's continue. Uh, so we came back to New York, and then we thought about branding the, the, the band with a name. And uh, it was uh, Ingrid who came up with uh, uh, Artemis. And, and we did a particular performance at the Newport Jazz Festival in 2018, where the president of Blue Note Records, Don Waz, happened to be in the audience. And, uh, and he invited us not long after that to join, join the label. So that's where the... Um, you know where the record uh, recording you know, that was the the blossoming of the recording contract, and uh, and we also did a, a fantastic, uh, exciting show at Carnegie Hall um, as well. So that was um, that was something I'll never forget. <laughs> mm. Mm. Oh, well, we, we were just chatting. It's interesting because Amanda and I, obviously being 
women jazz musicians are, are often asked about being women jazz musicians. And yeah. I, for many, many years, I think we both really avoided talking about it um, uh -huh. because we wanted to be, um, just play the music, you know, just play gigs and yeah. be hired because, you know, we were able to contribute in our way. And I think both of us um, love accompanying and started off playing in other people's bands and wanting to be in the rhythm section and just hired by other people. And um, and it's been very recently that we've felt like wanting to talk about it a bit more. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and part of it, seeing, I think, Artemis and also all the stuff Terry Lynn Carrington is doing around this um, mm -hmm. is helping us feel a little bit more um, encouraged and to, to, to speak about some of the stuff around um, just raising the level, the amount of women getting more involved in this music, because as you speak about, we have so much fun. Like we enjoy music so much. It's so much fun. <laughs> Playing jazz is joyful and fun and creative and gorgeous. And, and we're always like, you know, more of you should join. Da, da, da. So um, really just how do we encourage more uh, women? And so my question for you is, um, you know, a lot of us would say, yeah, it's just about the music. Just, you know, learn, do the work and, and the, the music will take care of you if you take care of the music. But obviously with this, it's a bit more of a statement. You know, we're leaning into more of, a, OK, here are these group of fantastic musicians who happen to be women. And we're kind of stepping out to just here we are. Um, so did you I'm just curious how you felt about, you know, because obviously you're a brilliant musician and, and a world class artist. But I'm sure there were times where there was, you know, it was pointed out or you were made to, to, you know, just, I'm just curious what your story around that was, because it must have changed a little bit in the past few years, maybe because you had a group of women that you were just like, yeah, this is just going to be great music, full stop. So it's ready to, to. so just, I'm just curious yeah, what your I mean, relationship with that I, is. Right. I, I find that I, I, I find that it's more other people who want to discuss mm -hmm. uh, the aspect of women in jazz rather than the actual women themselves. I think <laughs> that we're just playing, we're just making music and mm -hmm. our gender doesn't play a huge role for us. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, in terms of Artemis, we chose to play together. Granted, it did begin as an all woman, you know, specifically this promoter wanted an all woman band. So yeah, mm -hmm. it did start with that aspect of gender, but it didn't continue because of that. If we didn't right. enjoy playing together, we wouldn't be playing together. So the fact that we're out here and we're all women and and i think sometimes people take offense uh usually men oh well, i can't play in that band i'm a i'm a guy you know well it's just absurd i mean think about all the male bands there are out here do we walk around saying oh your guys you know i can't be in that band i mean i just never thought that way and i still don't think that way um, I think the music is the bottom line. Again, preparation. Do your work. <laughs> Make it so that you're undeniably supposed to be there. You know, it's undeniable that you're great or you're, you're extremely talented and that you have something to say on your instrument or with your voice. And that's why you're there. You're no different than a ballet dancer or, or Emily Carr or Margaret mm -hmm. Atwood or any other person who who is of the female gender who partakes in art, in the making of art. Mm -hmm. um, gender, uh, it transcends, uh, oh, no, sorry, mu the music transcends gender. All art transcends gender. So I, I really, you know, I don't see the big deal, even though I know that a lot of women have struggled. And there are moments in my life that I can look back and, and remember mm, an attitude or something subtle happening that I felt was because I was female. And, you know, I just don't put much stock in it, never did. I just feel like I'm just here to make music and 
that's my job and take it or leave it. Mm. You know, it doesn't, the, the gender just doesn't really play a role. And even if it does, you know, maybe I do play a piece more gently or perhaps it encompasses more of a female uh, uh, stereotype of lightness or, or femininity. Who cares? Bring it on. That's great. Why is that considered negative? Mm. It should be, art should reflect all aspects of, of our mm. lives and of our women mm. uh, mm. or masculinity. Mm. You know, whatever mm. it is, mm. it, why should there be boundaries based on, mm. you know, what people per perceive as being, uh, you know, gender related? Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. Uh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. I, I think Amanda and I, well, Amanda, you can speak. You spoke a little bit about this, about your last album, working with words. I, I worked with words as well. And there was a, a reluctance at first to even share these songs I'm writing with words, you know, uh, because it felt like, I don't know if this is going to be, well, how this is going to be well received. Cause it felt like I was tapping in the time I was a young mom and the songs that were coming out of me were, were just kind of really they were tender and like intimate and, and I was like mm, I don't know you know uh but I did it anyway and it was really well received and it was a bit of a you know you, the worst person is often in your head trying to convince you just do your thing make your art put it out in the world and you know uh you are who you are and your experience is your experience in your body and your experience and mm -hmm. so there's so many facets of our personality um absolutely can, as, to be allowed to come out album. that's a beautiful album by the way and oh, so okay. is Amanda, earth voice oh, as well thank you. you know um just gorgeous writing and playing uh you know i mean i mean i think what's important to to think about when you're creating and putting something out there it, it's about truth if you're truthful mm. to yourself as an artist it's going to connect to somebody maybe not mm. everybody but that doesn't matter you know we're making art we're not trying to sell you know, 10 million copies <laughs> so <laughs> you know maybe somebody likes foie gras maybe more people like a, a big mac you know <laughs> It doesn't really matter, you know, as long as you're being truthful to yourself, I feel that's the most mm. important ingredient in mm. your music. And that mm. will someone, people, even audience members, you know, I think a lot of people who listen to jazz, uh, or I should say people who maybe don't listen to jazz, they say, oh, it's too complex, it's too hard mm. to understand. Um, but if there's truth there, in the music, yes. it can reach people. You don't need to understand what we're playing in terms of harmony or rhythm or anything. If the music connects, that's all that matters. So mm. for me, that's, and, and that goes across the board in all genres of music, you know? Yeah. Whether we're talking Bob Dylan or Billie Holiday yeah. or Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's what, what you hear, what, what, how do you connect to it? Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, I wanted like, I wish you didn't live so far away. I, we just want to have like coffee with you. I'm not, I, oh. I've already had two cups, but I made to have them early. So I wasn't too chatty and interrupting you. <laughs> so, um, Wow. Yeah. It's so, yeah. Writing from the heart and um, um, the authenticity piece, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the things that I love about uh, yeah, everything you do. It's just, it's just very grounded. It's coming from a real sense of like, you know, um, it's just, you're just a very grounded, but yet brilliant, like sparkly musician. It's really, it's like you're strong in the back and soft in the front. You know, your heart's so open when you play, but you, there's this power I'm there too. <laughs> Sorry? No, I'm making a joke. Never mind. Oh, make a joke. When I didn't hear it, I was too busy. Uh, you know, there's a delay. I didn't hear the joke. Yeah. Amazing. So, Amanda, do you want to add, add anything to, to that? 
Well, yeah, I just, I really love what you're saying about the, you know, making music from the heart and then people will connect it or some people, the, the people that matter to you will connect with it. And um, I definitely um, have, you know, letting go of some, some thoughts about what I, you know, what I should write and, uh, you know, just letting myself write from the heart. I've definitely seen that that just makes for better music for sure all around. So I love what you had to say there. So beautiful. So I wonder if we should do, should we, what should we do, Jody? Should we do the take five questions? So yeah, yeah. You know what? I think there may be another round table discussion about um, the motherhood stuff because I think a lot of mm, women in my world who are pondering this life into music also go, well, actually I want a family too. How do I do those two things? So, um, and I didn't know what to do. I remember when I was pregnant with my son, I was Googling pregnant based ladies. <laughs> like, I was like, I'm like, I don't know. What does this even look like? So that's such a cool story about a Kim playing pregnant and touring pregnant. Cause I did tour pregnant too. Um, with Seamus Blake and Joel Haynes. And I was six and seven months pregnant doing uh, the touring and it was quite the experience, but really fun too. Of course, my son came out like snapping his fingers <laughs> with a good time. Um, but um, but maybe we'll chat about that another time. Maybe we'll have you back on later, maybe with a group of, of, of cool jazz women who have ventured into this world because it's pretty cool that Dylan, your son was involved on the Artemis album with you, is that that's correct, right? So he's yeah, he was yeah. helping. I needed, well, since I was producing the album, I just needed an extra set of ears and hands to, oh, great. Uh, you know, log what was happening in the session so that I could remember everything, including people's comments about what they liked or didn't like, or mm. what happened this track or that track. So he was very uh, uh, meticulous with his note taking and, and invaluable to me. So that was really nice. Okay. And as, as you may or may not know, he's also involved in music. He's uh, mm -hmm. at this moment, he's uh, uh, has a band called Tula Vera. He's a rock guitar player and a songwriter and his tastes go way across the board. He's uh, mm. He doesn't play jazz, but he's very familiar with it and, and can identify musicians and singers. Um, and he's very much a historian of the music, too, in the pop world, which is mm. I, I'm learning a lot from him um, about that. Uh, but he's a, he's a very talented young guy, and I just can't wait till this pandemic <laughs> as everyone else feels too is over so that he can get back to his life um mm -hmm. and performing but he does teach uh guitar uh so he's been able to be doing that during this time mm -hmm. period as well but i just feel like everybody's lives are on hold and it's it is it's true to make plans and move forward but mm -hmm. the growing up or how or being a mom and having having a child uh uh, as, a, as a professional musician, was it's challenging. There's no doubt about it. And if you're touring, that's a whole other consideration. Um, but I've been lucky enough in, in both of my marriages, uh, my first marriage to Billy Drummond, a great drummer who's Dylan's dad, uh, and, and also with Bill, who had two girls. So I was a stepmom to two mm. little girls as well. So it, it's just a give and take, and you just take every time period as it comes along and do your best and sometimes you know there was compromises where you know you wouldn't go out on the road then because the other person was gone and somebody had to be minding the store so that's that but I don't regret one moment of any of that because your children grow up so fast and you know Dylan's 22 now and and uh it just seems I would wish I could relive some of those years again uh I just felt like you just go by so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. My son's twelve, 12 now. Music, as you said, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned that it was inspiring you to write a certain mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. and I think there's there's an element to that too, because mm -hmm. it really just opens up a, 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 a new world of love. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think just when he was really little, watching him create effortlessly and just mm. cr like explore 
I, I remember just watching him in awe and be like, oh, right. That's it. Like it was, he was like my teacher, like do it, just make stuff, you know, yeah. um, don't worry so much, just explore. And I, so that wonder that, that he brought back into my life, I, I I'm so grateful for it. Still, it's still there. <laughs> he's 12. He's awesome. Yeah. But I, I've been watching Dylan a little bit, you know, following your career and seeing occasional things on social media about him and following him and just, yeah, it, enjoying yeah. watching yeah. that. Yeah. You just be so yeah. prolific yeah. and knowing you're raising this beautiful, this beautiful young person um, into being. It's been fun. It's your best art project, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, yes. there's a song. Um, I, I did a project with a, a lyricist named David Heydu, who's mm -hmm. also a music critic. And the, the album is called, um, uh, oh, my God. Ice on the Hudson? Yes, thank Ice you. On the Hudson? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's We've done 17, song. that's okay. <laughs> There's one song on it called I Used to Like to Draw. And mm. um, actually, you could probably look it up on, on YouTube, but uh, Jenna Siegel of, of Manhattan Transfer, uh, she sings a beautiful rendition of it. We did it uh, during the pandemic. We did a duet. It's also on the album, so you can hear it, hear it from the album. But we did a one of those live things that wasn't live where I recorded the piano part and then she recorded the voice over top of it. But anyway, I'm digressing. The song is all about that and just remembering what it was like when you were a child and how you would just draw and create things and you would think about it and and you know, this one's a purple frog, this is an astronaut, you know, I'm just you're just expressing yourself so naturally. And uh this the song is about that. So if anyone wants to to check that out, it's called I Used to Like to Draw. I uh, used to like to draw. It's on YouTube, I'm assuming. Yeah. YouTube. Yeah, both both versions yeah. are on YouTube. And of course Janice um is on the record, isn't she? She's singing on yes. the record as yeah. well. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have a variety right. of vocalists on that. That's, That's a beautiful right. record. As well, I mean, there's so many beautiful records. I know for me, ancestors will always be in my heart. 1995, I'm in in university, yeah. and that one is like stamped. Wow. <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, any um, so should we do our um, our speed round there, my friends? Yes. We always do like we like to wrap things up with a bit of a speed round, just to getting to know our guests speed round okay. so um there's kind of short answers <laughs> although you know if you want to expand you can but all right um yeah what is it what, to... what is your favorite swear word <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> all right that, well here's if, if this was like a podcast maybe <laughs> we would do that for sure so here's yeah. here's our first question then. So what do you miss most about living in Vancouver? I miss my family, I miss my friends, and I miss being close to nature. I miss being able to go for a walk on the seawall or go up Grouse Mountain. There, that's my short answer. So many good things. Yeah. Amanda, do you miss it too? Yeah, same, all I'm those same things. <laughs> Keep, you guys can always move back here. I'd be fine. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you can stay at my place. We have a guest room. <laughs> um, what is your favorite venue to play in? I would say the Village Vanguard Club. Mm. The sound is just uh, so beautiful. Uh, the shape of the club is triangle and I think there's just something about the shape of the room that allows the musician performing as well as the audience to just hear in a very uh, clear way um, and also because of the history of the club and the spirits that you feel inhabit that space when you go on stage to play there's a part of it that just it just feels sacred. It's like a sacred experience. So I would I would have to say okay. mm. yeah, amazing. Um, so who are your th the three people that lit the spark 
uh, in music for you as a young musician? I know you mentioned Bob Bergliati. Yeah, Hopefully I said Bob that right. Bergliati would be <laughs> my first choice there because without him, I don't think I would be doing what I'm doing today. Um, probably a bassist in Vancouver named Wyatt Ruther. He oh, lived Wyatt. there. Mm -hmm. Did you ever meet him, Jody? I never met him, but I have listened. Well, I'm very close with Ollie as well, Ollie sure. and Patty. Oh, so, yeah. um, so just through the recordings, I never, I never did meet him, but obviously his spirit looms large. Um, yeah. He was, he was a bit of a mentor for me when mm. I first started to work on the scene. Um, we would play duets together in various venues, and uh, he just taught me a lot about just how to dig in and, and play and learn songs and be spontaneous. And mm. uh, He had a very gentle way about him, but he made a big impact on me. Mm. Um, and the third person, I think, would be Oliver Gannon whom you just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, Oliver and Patty were dear friends, or are, uh, of course, Patty's yes. no longer with us, but, but Oliver, uh, just Oliver's beautiful spirit uh, playing and, and the experiences I had when I lived there playing with him. Uh, we, we, we didn't only just play jazz, we had a Brazilian group together for a while uh, where I learned a lot of Brazilian songs and I'm still very influenced by by Brazilian music and Brazilian musicians uh, mm. love 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 that uh, art form so Ollie I'm gonna start crying I love him so much <laughs> Patty I was playing outside a grocery store in White Rock <laughs> First time I met Patty, and really? she came up to me. I was playing electric bass with my high school combo in front of the Save On Food, or no, it would have been—I oh. don't remember what it was, it was Safeway or something. Opening the, <laughs> opening, the, and she comes barreling up to me, says, "Who are you?" <laughs> My name's Patty, and Ollie kind of comes up behind her and says, "I knew a knew of Ollie." Anyway, I'll never forget that first meeting. She was. Just, I miss her so much. Um, yeah, she yeah. was effervescent. Effervescent. Great bass player, too. Great and singer. Yeah. The two of them are just, yeah. they're, um, yeah, men, you know, mentors, and I, I want to be them when I grow up kind of people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Amazing. So, um, Rini, maybe you have um, um, a, a hobby or interest outside music that you love that maybe we don't know about. Uh, well, or maybe you I, don't. <laughs> I you, but they're they're just kind of commonplace. Um, yeah, I love cooking, uh, especially during this time period. I've been trying a lot of different recipes, and uh, I I love to eat, so I enjoy I enjoy trying different things, and uh, so cooking, uh, gardening. Mm -hmm. This time of year, there's not much to do, but uh, not like out in Vancouver. <laughs> um, but um, I do love, I do love gardening, and I love photography as well. So photography, yeah, amazing. You guys should follow Instagram, Rini's Instagram, because she always posts these beautiful photographs of travels around the world. I, it's like a nature fest. It's beautiful. Plus, <laughs> great vault photos. I put, you posted one of Joe Henderson dancing at a discotheque. Oh, yeah. That was, <laughs> Just that was really not <laughs> love that. It's well, like a history. Joe and Rufus Reed in, in, so in a good. disco. Yeah. So good. So good. So... Uh, I'm wondering, we do have a, just a couple questions from people tuning in. I wonder if, if uh, we could get you to answer those if there's a little no bit of time. Problem. Yeah. So um, question one is, uh, did you ever meet or hang with Miles Davis? I did not. Although I do have one small Miles Davis story, which I've actually never shared with anyone. <gasps> um, scoop. scoop. <laughs> uh, I... The first album I played on was an album with uh, a tenor player named uh, Gary Thomas. Uh, the album's called Seventh Quadrant. And um, he 
was working with Miles at the time, and he gave Miles a copy of his album, his new album, to, to listen to. And evidently, through Gary, he, he said, Miles really dug my playing. And he said, he asked for my phone number. And uh, so Gary said, don't be surprised if you get a call from Miles Davis. So that was my one big Miles Davis story. And I did not receive a call from Miles Davis. <laughs> and I've never shared that story because it seems like it's not really that important. But anyway, that's, <laughs> Ooh, that's important. That's yeah, that is amazing. Um, amazing. Well, another question um, someone asked, what advice would you give to emerging jazz composers in terms of getting your works out there? How do you, it works out there? I, I, I don't know. My initial reaction to that is don't worry about getting your works out there because it, it will happen sooner or later uh, if the quality is there. So I would just say work on your craft. And when mm. the time comes for you to be able to make a recording or you feel that you're ready to make a recording, the recording will get your work out there. And uh, you'll be able to do that when, when the time is right for you, whenever that is. But if you're quite a young musician and you're just uh, working at developing your craft, I think that's, you know, that's a good place to be uh, when you're young is, is, is don't, don't worry so much about, uh, you know, exposure at that time. Mm -hmm. Really, the important thing is to develop and grow and become the best musician you can be so that when you have the opportunity to finally record that um, you're putting out the best you know that you can do at that particular time and people will hear it and gravitate towards it great advice focus mm -hmm. on the craft um and then the i think we have one more question from uh, buckingham palace out in in uh, in calgary um so terry lynn carrington mm -hmm. says she didn't realize all the subtext that ran through her head when she played with in a group with uh women Sorry, until she re played, let me start that over. Terry yeah. Lynn Carrington says she didn't realize all the subtext that ran through her head until she played in a group with women. And uh, she felt freed from these messages that were going in her head. Actually, she's playing in, in groups with, with other male musicians. Has this been an experience for you? Or how um, can you well, relate to this? I, 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 not really, um, only because I'm not sure what subtext she's referring to. If she's talking about maybe negative thoughts, um, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't really relate to that. I mean, only if specific th moments where things might have happened, um, you know, but I'm talking about really specific moments, not in, in general. I mean, when I go on the bandstand to play, I'm just really trying to think about the music and nothing else. Um, mm -hmm. But if somebody had an attitude at one time or or was not kind, yeah, those moments do do happen sometimes, and you you have to really just uh, combat that with excellence. <laughs> the power of the music has to has to speak <laughs> to that. Mm. That's a good statement to end with. Combat <laughs> that with excellence. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so, so much for, for being here, Rini. And I don't know if you, there's anything you want to just let the audience know that's that's coming up. I know what there were some links to um, a show you did with Ron Carter filmed yesterday, I think you said, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, so actually, think... it was filmed uh, a few months ago, but they filmed oh, okay. yesterday. So, yeah. So I think um, well, there's, there's maybe one other thing I could mention, which is is that um, I'm sure you both are familiar with or or, or knew Shannon Gunn, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, my wonderful friend and vocalist who passed away last yeah. July. And uh, I just want to let everybody know that uh, there was an album we recorded back in 2002. Um, with Brad Turner, Neil Swainson, oh, yes. and on drums, Pat LaBarbera, uh, and myself, and we resurrected it, and it wow. never released. And Corey Weeds of Cellar Jazz oh, is here yes. in uh, in September or, or wait, October, I think. 
Uh, and it's just a beautiful album, and it makes me so sad that she wasn't around to enjoy that. Um, I'm not sure why she really didn't release it, um, but it definitely deserves to be heard by everyone, and I'm so proud of it, and I'm so proud of the work that she did. And it includes three compositions of her own, and she uh, wrote both the lyrics and the music, and she mm. was really a wonderful composer. And again, I just, I feel like it's so tragic that she's gone now, and you know, that was recorded literally 20 years ago. And all the music and recordings she could have been doing after that, you know, she mm. was really quite, I think, a more remarkable musician and singer than people understood. And, um, and at least there's this single kind of recorded document of her work that will finally come out and stand uh, in you know, be, be her legacy, part of her legacy. And uh, so I'm really excited about that, but I just wanted to <sighs> put it out there so people can look forward to hearing it. Um, Amazing. You know, yeah. it remind it makes me think of this uh, moment. I remember watching, uh, I think it was John Lennon, a week before he was killed, oh. having a conversation with his son, Sean. It was like a little video that was in a documentary where he, Sean was singing his songs, like one of his Beatles tunes. And John Lennon said, you know, I don't remember who wrote that one. If it was me or Paul, I don't remember. But I remember when Tristan was really young and I leaned over to my husband and said, you know, he lost his dad a week later, but he has the art forever. And it reminds, this is like a beautiful way of keeping Shannon's spirit alive for all of yeah. us who, are, especially those who had her you know, intimately in their life, but for the rest of us too, because again, her impact lives large in Canadian jazz in particular as an educator. And there's a lot of yes. people who really love her. So thank you to you for, for helping bring this forward. This is a, a really important way of us all being able to tap into her spirit, even with her not being yes. with us anymore. Yes. So yes. it's beautiful. I'm happy about it. Yay. You ate a Corey. Yes. <laughs> so looking forward to that. Yeah. So we'll make sure. Maybe we can have you uh, back on when that comes out and you can talk I about Shannon. I would love and... to do that. We could do a listening session maybe or something. Like yeah. That. that would be so yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Maybe. For sure. Well, um, before we go, I just want to say what fans I am of you both and the music <laughs> that you're making and the beautiful albums that you put out over the years. And, um, you know, this the Earth Voice is the last album I get. Is that your last album, Amanda? Yes. Yeah. A couple months ago released. Yeah. <laughs> very beautiful work. And mm. and Sun Songs as well. Just uh, thank you. It's great. I'm you know, yay. <laughs> keep on <laughs> trying to keep on making beautiful music. Yeah. Let's we'll just keep yeah, on making yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. And sharing. So and so and exciting. Yeah, and, and likewise, Renee. Thank you so much because I, I really, I, we really did mean it at the beginning. How uh, such a huge influence your music and your playing, uh, your compositions have been on us. So thank you so much for that and uh, and for doing this today, for being here with us and celebrating yeah, International Women's Day. Great, to, great way to spend a Sunday afternoon. Yay! <laughs> Amazing. Yay. Well, take so care, until, and until we see you back in Toronto or Vancouver. Yes. We'll uh, we'll November make sure to come. Artemis November twelfth. Yes, Hall. amazing. Well, we'll put Yay. the link uh, in the in the chat for sure. Massey for Theater, sure. right? Massey. Uh, Kerner. No, no, Kerner or Kerner Hall. Hall. Yeah, Kerner Hall. Perfect. Amazing. Yeah, beautiful Kerner Hall. That's amazing. Yes. Take well, good care of yourself, Rini. Thank you. Thank Be well. You. Thank you. So thank, you. thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye for now. Bye.